Oh my, I tell you what, it is good. What a, what a great song. We, you know, we, we are the body. And if we are the body, then why aren't we going? And why aren't we reaching out? Why aren't folks getting saved? And it just overwhelms you to think about what, what could be, what should be, what will be. And God is just really, really stirring our hearts. And some great, great things coming up. But we, we've got to go out. We've got to reach out. We've got to find lost folks. And we've got to lead them to Christ. That's what God commanded us to do. And so there are lost people out there. And he wants us to go and, and be the body, the hands and feet of Christ. What a great song. Thank you, guys. Well, let's turn in our Bibles to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. And we'll pick up in verse 8. And read down through verse 13. Uh, I'm surprised I have any voice left at all, John. All the shouting we did and all the fun we had. And, and uh, just, just good to, to, to be able to worship the Lord. Right. You know, and, and, and it's good to worship Him at any side. I don't care if I'm with five people or 5,000. But, you know, one, one day we're going to be in glory. It's going to be just millions and millions of people. We're going to worship the Lord together. It's going to be good. And so what, uh, what, what, what great hope we have. Well, James chapter 2, verse... 8 through 13, we've been talking for the last uh, two weeks about the sin of partiality. Uh, the, the believers there to whom James was writing to, they were showing special treatment to a rich guy that walked in, uh, but they showed very shameful treatment to a poor man that entered into their, their facilities. Uh, James revealed that the sin of being prejudiced uh, toward one person over another was a result of evil motives and it was inconsistent with the very character of God who, who is no respecter of persons. God loves everybody. He desires to have a relationship with everybody. He wants everybody brought into his kingdom. And so because God shows no partiality, then therefore his followers uh, must not show partiality. But this was a problem 2,000 years ago that James had witnessed uh, in a service, he had addressed the situation, and it seems like we haven't learned much in 2,000 years because the sin of partiality is still uh, among us today. And so we must make sure it's not within our hearts and say, God, help me not to be guilty of the sin of partiality. Now, James rebuked, uh, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for the very same sin that James is talking about. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 23, 23. Woe to you! Scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Wow, what a statement. You think I preach hard. For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and yet have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. So J Jesus talking to the Pharisees, they were supposed to be reaching out the spiritual leaders of Israel and trying to do all they could to build God's kingdom, and yet they were being very prejudiced. And so Jesus rebuked them and called them hypocrites because it was inconsistent with the very character of the God they said they knew and loved. Well, let's consider some facts about being prejudiced as we examine part three of this subject, the problem with partiality. The problem with partiality out of James chapter 2, reading verses 8 through 13. Let's stand together all over the building as we honor and reverence the reading of God's perfect word. James chapter 2, starting in verse 8, reading down to verse 13. You fall along as I read because this now is the inspired word of God. If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and con are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Let's pray together. Would you one more time ask God to speak to you? Is there any area of your life where the sin of partiality is prevalent? Is there any group of people, any race of people, that you do not like? Would you ask that God would help you to see all people as he sees them? And if you've been hurt in the past, would you ask that God would give you the grace to forgive that person? 
Father, in Jesus' name, we are grateful that you are no respecter of persons and that you love all people everywhere. And Lord, you are building your kingdom. It belongs to you. And as your bond servants, we belong to you. And Lord, as we just sung about a moment ago, we desire to be your feet and your hands to go out into a lost and dying world, a world that is hurting, that needs to know that Jesus loves them. Would you help us to overcome the sin of partiality in our own hearts individually and corporately? Would you help us to be a people that is on fire for you? Speak into our lives right now, and we will obey. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. Well, thank God that for two things, one, that he loved a sinner such as I, and two, that he loved more than people just like me. Uh, life would be boring if everybody was just like me. So the first thing I noticed this morning is the sin of partiality. The sin of partiality. And James gives us the description of the royal law in verse 8. He says, if, however... You are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture. Then he names it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. Remember in the first seven verses, he said, I walked into a church service. I saw a situation there. There was two guys that walked in. One was rich and had a lot of money, very influential. He, was, he received very special treatment. The usher came and took him down to the very front row and said, here's a seat of honor. We're glad you're here. We hope that you'll join because we want folks just like you to be a part of our church. And then there was a poor guy that came in right behind the rich guy. And they said, tell that guy to go stand over there in the corner or let him sit on the floor somewhere. But whatever you do, don't let him get near the rich guy because he may offend him and run him off. And we certainly don't want that to happen. And so James says, what you're doing is you have evil motives and you are committing sin. But then he says, if, because not everybody commits the sin of partiality, but if you are fulfilling the royal law and you are loving your neighbors yourself, he says, you're doing a good job. Keep it up. And so why is it called the royal law? It's, it's the king of all laws. Jesus was asked the very important question, well, what's the most important commandments? We've got a whole bunch of them, but gee, what do you say? is really that something you would challenge me to do. What, what commandments should I obey? And here's how he answered that question. In Mark chapter 12, verse 30 and 31, Jesus said, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, with all your strength. Basically, you are to love God with all you can. You just give your absolute whole heart into loving God. When we were sinners, we did all we could to serve Satan. We loved sin. We did it willingly and joyfully. We were all in. But now that we're born again and God's changed our lives, we ought to be all in for God and say, just as hard as I ran after sin, I want to run after the Savior. And I want to serve Him and give my very best. I guarantee you that football game later on today, you, you might have heard of the game later on. And, and there's going to be a lot of folks there. They're going to be shouting. They're going to be carrying on. They spend thousands of dollars on their tickets. Or, or they'll hang out at their house or they'll go to a bar or they'll do whatever. But they'll watch that game and they'll be passionate about that game, especially if their team wins. Uh, then they'll really get excited. And just as passionate as they are for a football game, we ought to be more so for the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus says the most important thing you could ever do is give God your very best. Serve Him with all that you are. But then He says there's another one. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Wow, what a statement. And so Jesus says these are the most important commandments. Then I would do well to say God... Help me to do all I can to obey those two commandments. Help me to do all that I can to love you and serve you and give you my very best. Then help me to do all I can to find other people and love on them the way that you would if you came in contact with them. So Jesus said this is an important command and you ought to listen up and pay attention to it. Listen to what Romans 13.10 says. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Wow. God is love. He's the very essence of love. And he loves all people. And he commands us, go and love all people. If we truly loved our neighbors, we could get rid of thousands of complicated laws. It's a shame when you see so much violence on TV. And, and, and you watch the news and this one's been stabbed, and this one's been shot, and this one's been robbed, and this person got beat up. And thousands of complicated laws could be done away with if we just simply love our neighbors, we love ourselves. 
If we just treat people the way that God commands us to treat people, what a world this would be. And it starts with the body of Christ. Well, not only do we see the description of the royal law, but let's take it a step further. What about the disobedience to the royal law? The disobedience. So James says, here's what God commands you to do, to love uh, your neighbor uh, as yourself. But unfortunately, they weren't doing that. Look at verse 9. But if you show partiality, and they were showing partiality, and James highlighted that by the treatment of the poor guy uh, in comparison to the treatment of the rich guy. He said, but if you show partiality, you are committing sin. Wow. And are convicted by the law as transgressors. Greek scholar Kenneth Wiest, he translates this phrase, but if, as is the case, you are showing partiality. It, it, James is not just throwing out a hypothetical and saying, well, sometimes people don't always act nice towards the neighbors. He's saying, I've seen this scene myself. I've witnessed it. I've noticed two guys coming into the church, one rich, one poor, and they didn't receive the same treatment. And so James is saying, I'm not talking about hypotheticals. I'm talking about reality. I'm talking about what's going on in the church. And he's saying that you need to put a stop to that kind of behavior. And now here he's saying that if, as is the case, you are showing partiality, then you are committing sin. It's not just a character flaw, it is sin. The idea is that they were showing partiality, thus disobeying the royal law that God says was the most important of all of them. If they obeyed the royal law, they would treat all people equally because you would not mistreat yourself. So I am to love my neighbor as myself. How would I want to be treated? That's how I'm to treat other people. I don't treat them the way they treat me, I treat them as I would desire to be treated. So I don't say, if you're nice to me, I'll be nice to you. Well, if you're just like me and you act like me, then I'll be nice to you. But if you're mean to me, I'll fix you. I'll get you back. You won't talk to me that way. That's a heart that is not in line with the will of God. We don't say, I'll get them back. They're not going to talk to me that way. I don't know who they think they are, but they're about to find out. You ever hear somebody say, well, I just speak my mind. Well, not if you're under the control of the Holy Spirit, you don't. Oh, I used to. Yeah, I used to. I used to be a lot different than I am now. But the Holy Spirit changes you. And He would not allow me to respond the way that my flesh would desire to respond. Jerry Vines put it this way, the Christian never has the luxury of being unkind. And, and so you ought to treat people as you want to be treated, not how they treat you. So when you're in a restaurant and the waitress is a little bit slow, you don't say, I'll fix her. She'll get no tip from me at all. But not. And if you love the Lord, you say, you know what? She's probably having a bad day. I'm, I'm going to give her a little bit of extra tip. Because I want her to know that I'm a Christian. She saw me praying over my meal. And if she sees me leave out of here without giving her a tip, she's going to say, those Christians are a bunch of hypocrites and phonies. And so James moves from the sin of partiality and then he shows us the seriousness of partiality. Again, James doesn't beat around the bush. He, he really gets to it and he's really going to get to it in the second half of chapter 2 here. So there's the explanation in verse 9. He says, But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. That word transgressors means You've gone over the line. In other words, it's the, the old image of somebody putting a line in the sand saying, you, you cross that line, you've gone too far. And so what do they do? They say, I'm going to go over the line. I know God has boundaries, but I don't care. I'm going to go where I want to go. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to talk how I want to talk. I'm going to say what I want to say. I'm just going to do my own thing. And you've gone beyond the boundary. You've stepped over the line. You're a transgressor. It is sin. So prejudice is more than just being discourteous to people that you don't like. It is sin. And all sin is serious in God's sight. And so we got to say, this is the problem here. If I have an anger issue, then I don't just say, well, that's just the way I am. You know, I'm just Irish. We're always angry. No, you, you work on that. And you say, God, i got some issues in my life I need you to work on. And I want to get under the control of the Holy Spirit. And I want the Holy Spirit to, to help me to produce the fruit of the Spirit, which is love and joy and peace and patience. So I don't just say, this is the way I am. It's kind of how I'm wired. Or my dad was like this, so I'm not going, dad, now. No, no, you change the way you are because the Holy Spirit is working in your heart and in your life and He changes the way you behave. So you don't just say, this is the, the character I have, I just speak my mind. 
You say, God, I have sin in my life, and I want you to help me get it out. And so all sin is an offense to a holy God. Look at verse 10. He says, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. Well, you stumble in one point. The question is, if you're hanging uh, from a chain and it's hanging from the ceiling and you're, you have a, a pit of alligators, or maybe like that big lion that we got a picture with the other day. You see the teeth on that thing? Y'all see that thing on Facebook? Good night. His paw is as big as my head. And, and, and Gail asked me, do you train cats? Not that big, I don't. <laughs> I'll put up with an aggressive Rottweiler, but not that big, old boy. And just, just picture if we were hanging over there and he's down and want to eat us. And you say, oh, I got a hundred links and they're all pretty strong, but one link is weak. Well, how many links do you want to uh, loosen up before you say, you know what, I think I'm going to let go of this chain. And so sometimes we think, well, yeah, I have this one sin in my life, but I do a lot of other good stuff, though. I, I got a lot of good links in my life, just got one bad one. Well, how many does it take? Now, there were two categories of sin. There was the sins of commission. That's when we do bad things, like showing partiality, adultery, murder, gossip, lying. It's when we do things that we know that we shouldn't do. And God's Word says, don't do these things. He said, you know what? I'm going to transgress. I'm going to step over the line. I'm going to go outside the boundaries. I'm going to do what I want to do, and I'm going to commit these sins. But then the other side of that is the sins of omission which is failing to do the good that I know I'm supposed to do. Sins like not witnessing, not using our spiritual gifts, not tithing. Things that we say, God says do these things, but I'm not doing them. And, and James will warn us there in chapter 4, verse 17, he says, therefore, to the one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. And so I can't just say, well, I'm not committing murder, I'm not lying, I'm not stealing. If I'm not doing the good things that God commands me to do, then I have sin in my life. And, and so let's go back to the song that just sang a moment ago. So if we are the body of Christ, then why aren't we reaching out? Why aren't we finding lost people and introducing them to Christ? Why aren't we doing all we can to build up the kingdom of God? If we're not doing those things, then it is sin. Vacation Bible school is coming up, and we say, God, you've given me spiritual gifts, and I want to use my spiritual gifts and be a faithful steward of that gift that you've given me. And so therefore, God, I want to get plugged in to help out with Vacation Bible School. Work day coming up. What can I do? I may not be able to do physically what other people can do, but can I do something? And the little bit that I can do, God, help me to do that bit. If I can't sing, can I do something else? Can I help out in the nursery? Can I help out with children's church? Can I run the sound system? Can I teach a class? Can I bring some breakfast? What can I do? God, help me do something instead of just saying, well, I can't do that. And so when I don't exercise my spiritual gifts, it's more than just being lazy and being unproductive and not being a good church member. It is sin. What we're saying is, God, the gifts that you gave me, I'm going to waste them. Wow. What about tithing? We know that God, he told the Pharisees, you should have done all the other things. You're tithing, that's good. He said, do all this stuff with the tithing. And so we know that God's uh, ministry costs money. It, it costs money to, to one ministry. And so we say, God, it is my privilege, my joy, and my honor is an act of worship when I put money in the offering plate. 10% is training wheels. We've got to eventually take off the, the training wheels and go beyond 10%. But we ought to start at least there. You know what they told us at the conference? They said that if every evangelical Christian in the country would just give 10%, they don't have to sell all your money, everything you have and give all your money to the church, just give 10%. They said we would bring in an additional 80 billion, with a B, dollars a year. Wow! What could the kingdom of God do with an additional 80 billion dollars a year? And that's just here in America. That's not all the Christians around the world. That's just those evangelical Christians say, God changed my life. I'm born again. I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. He said, if you would just give 10%. You know what they tell me? That they give an average of 2.7%. Wow. Unless you're an absolute cheapskate, you give the waitress 20%. And God said, just give me at least 10%. Just imagine what we could do if everybody would give. Wow. Incredible. And that's the sin of omission. 
And James said, it doesn't matter what part you break, you got to do it all. you got to stop doing the bad things and do the good things. He says, if you commit one sin in one area, at one point of the law, he says, you become guilty of all. A.T. Robinson, Greek scholar, said, to be a lawbreaker, one does not have to violate all the laws, but he must keep all the law to be a law-abiding citizen. Wow. So you say, well, I've never robbed a bank, so therefore I'm not a criminal. Well, have you ever gone beyond the speed limit? <laughs> have you ever rolled through a stop sign? Eh, nobody around. I'm going on through. Well, maybe the cop wasn't there didn't give you a ticket, but you still broke the law. So just because you don't rob a bank, or you're not involved in a gang, or you don't sell drugs, doesn't mean you're not a criminal. We're all criminals. At some point. Just because we don't do the really bad crimes doesn't mean we're still not a criminal. In order to be a law by decision, you have to obey all the laws, every law. You can't just say, well, I have a lead foot, but at least I'm not in a gang and I don't sell drugs and never robbed a bank. And so all of us are criminals and we're all sinners who have broken God's holy law. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every single person has sinned and broken God's holy law. And so we got to look at it and say, God, in what areas of my life have I broken your law? And is one of those areas the sin of partiality? And if so, help me to overcome being prejudiced. Well, after James gives the explanation, he then gives the elaboration. So James says, let me elaborate and speak a little further on what I'm talking about. Look at verse 11. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. And so some of the people thought, well, I'm not doing that bad because I'm not committing the really bad sins. And what James is saying is that you cannot justify your sin by looking at somebody else's sin and saying, at least I'm not as bad as that guy. At least I'm doing better than that person. And so therefore, we try to find somebody who is further away from God than we are to make ourselves feel better. And, and say, well, at least I come to church. Well, I don't tithe, but I put in a little bit of money, a couple dollars. Well, yeah, I'm not here every time there's an activity or every time there's a work day, but I show up once in a while. And so there's some members don't even show up at all. Some people don't put no money in the offering place. Some people don't serve in any capacity, so therefore I'm better than them. And the problem is we try to find somebody who's not doing anything to make ourselves feel good. Instead of saying, God, you're my standard, and I'm not trying to outdistance everybody else. I'm trying to outdistance myself. I'm trying to move beyond where I was in 2017 and not just say, am I doing better than most of the church members? But I'm saying, God, I'm not in competition with anybody but myself. And so I'm trying to give more, serve more, do more, witness more than I used to do. And when you look at it and say, God, how am I doing compared to where I was? If I've been walking with you for a while, have I made any prog progress in that area? We were talking about it Wednesday night. What do we need to do to be close to God? And Jesus said, if you want to be close to me, here's what you've got to do. You've got to deny yourself. You've got to take up your cross daily, and you've got to follow me. And so unless you're willing to die to yourself, deny all of your agenda, your goals, your vision, your dreams, all the things you want in your life, and be totally devoted to me, follow me every step of the way, he says, then you cannot be close to me. But if anybody will do those things, they will be close to God. Because God is no respecter of persons. And so we got to say, God, where am I at and where should I be? And stop looking at everybody else and saying, let me go find somebody who's not doing anything for the kingdom and compare myself to them, make myself feel good. And say, God, I should be much further along. Wow. And so he says that it is the one, one was not committing adultery and felt they were doing pretty good, but they were committing murder. Now James is going to elaborate a little bit more on that murder situation down there in chapter 4. When he said there were some murders in the church, and they're probably looking at like, I haven't killed anybody. And you're going to say, wait a minute, now Jesus said, even if you're angry, you've committed murder. Well, I'm not sleeping around. No, 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 Jesus said, that's, that's okay. Uh, even if you're looking, 
I committed, a, I considered adultery. Wow. So Jesus, I didn't come to lower the bar. I came to raise the bar. If you thought that just because I'm coming to give you grace, you can just live any way you want to, you, you, you misunderstood. He said, I'm coming to raise the standard. And to me, looking is adultery. Being angry is murder. So James said, we got some murderers in the church. Wow, we're going to find out if we have any or not. So James said, eh, maybe you're not committing adultery and you feel pretty good about yourself because you're faithful to your wife, but are you committing murder? And his point is not that one is more important than the other, that if you don't commit this sin, then you're okay with that sin. What he's saying is sin is sin. Any violation of God's law is an abomination to a holy God. And he doesn't say, well, you're committing small sins. These are not that big of a deal, so I'm going to let this stuff slide. But if you get up here and commit these really bad sins, then I'll talk to you. Now, he's saying all sin is an abomination to a holy God. Everything that we do. So we cannot justify our gossip and say, well, I gossip and, and, and I'm negative and I'm critical and I complain, I stir up trouble and say, that's okay because I'm not doing these other bad sins over here. He says, no, it's all sin. And, and by the way, if you want to find out what God says about gossip and stirring up trouble, look at Proverbs chapter 6. Wow. Check that out on your way home. And although the effects and the consequences may vary depending on the sin, obviously if you commit murder, then it has serious consequences and effects to a, a person in their family. Depending on the sin, he says the point is still the same. Every sin violates God's holy law. So the consequences and the effects may change depending on the level of sin, but it's still a violation to God's law. Not only does James show us the seriousness of uh, partiality and the sin of partiality, but what about the sentencing for partiality? The sentencing for partiality. Now it's amazing that James, he puts the sin of partiality in the same group as adultery and murders. Wow. And so while some of them might have just thought, well, I just don't like the poor guy. He hasn't taken a bath in a long time anyway, and he stinks, he's sitting down next to me and you know, asking me for money for lunch. I'd rather be hanging out with a rich guy over here who's probably going to buy me lunch. And, and James said, it's more than just a character flaw. It's more than just I don't like certain people because of their race or where they come from or how they talk. He said, no, this is a very serious sin. He said, and I'm putting you in the same category as murderers and adulterers. Wow. And, and so then he says, there's going to be a sentencing. God, God doesn't just look the other way when you commit sin because you think it's a small sin. So what about the fact of our judgment? Look at verse 12. He says, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. That those two words, speak and act, are present active imperatives. It speaks about our words and our works. What we say and how we do. How we talk to people and how we treat people. And they're ongoing imperatives. Remember, the imperative is a command. And they're present active, which means it's an ongoing command. So what he's saying is you are to continually talk to people and you are to continually treat people in a manner that is consistent with the Lord Jesus Christ, how he would talk to them, how he would treat them. We are to continually speak and act merciful to everyone with the reality that judgment day is coming. And I'm going to stand before Almighty God and give an account for every thought, word, and action. And, and so I don't just say this is just the character that I have. I just don't like some people and that's just their problem. I have to get over it. No, we say, I'm going to stand before a holy God one day. I'm going to give an account for this. And he's going to ask me questions about how I behaved. And how I talked, how I treated people. And so I can't just say, well, I just have a bad temper and I just fly off the handle. Uh, not if you're living in light of eternity. And you're mindful that one day you're going to stand before a holy God. Then I say, God, help me to act in such a way that on judgment day, I'll be pleased with your verdict. He says, to be judged. You see, we will indeed be judged. Romans 14.10 says, for we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. It's the Greek word, bema seat judgment. Now, every single person is going to give an account before God. The Christians are not going to be judged on their salvation, but they will be judged on their service. And they're going to stand before Almighty God at the bema seat judgment. The lost are going to be at the great white throne judgment. They've got bigger problems. But we're still going to stand before God and give an account for our life. Job 13.10, listen to this. He says, he will surely reprove you if you secretly show partiality. Wow. So it's not just how I talk to people, but even the thoughts in my mind. If I'm secretly showing partiality, God says, I know your motives. 
And, and so I noticed you didn't go up and say hello to that person. I, I noticed what you were doing over there. I noticed the thoughts in your mind you had when you saw that person. What's he doing here? I wish you'd go find another church. You shouldn't be coming to this kind of church. Well, we don't want that kind of crowd around here. And, and maybe you won't go up and say something to that person, but you're thinking in your mind. This isn't the place for them. They need to find a church somewhere else. We don't need their crowd around here. Or you see somebody out somewhere and you say, I bet that guy does drugs. Well, how do you know that? Well, he got tattoos and long hair. He must be done doing drugs. And that's what they did with these two guys who walked in the door. Some of them were outright showing partiality. They told him to go stand over in the corner. But some of them were probably secretly saying, I wish that guy wouldn't have came here today. Hope it doesn't run off that rich guy. We can't, lose, can't afford to lose him. And so he says, even if you do it secretly, God knows. He, he can read our minds. He can see in the dark. He knows what's happening. He knows the, the conversation to go on on the phone when nobody else knows. God said, I know all of that. I'm writing it all down. We're going to have a conversation one day. Ecclesiastes 12, 14 says, For God will bring every act to judgment. Wow. Everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. You see, a lot of folks think, I'm getting away with this. Nobody knows what I'm doing. God said, I do. And, and, and I may, in my mercy and grace, not expose you. I may expose you one day, but I may keep it hidden, but it doesn't mean I've forgotten about it. We're still going to talk about it on Judgment Day. He says, I will bring every act into judgment, even the hidden things you thought you got away with. God says, I know all about it, and I'm going to talk to you about it. Wow. So he says, the law of liberty. In verse 25 of chapter 1, he talked to us about looking intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty. It's the, the Word of God. He says, look into the Word and say, God, speak to me. Give me reality. Remember, the mirror never lies. The mirror does not make us look better than we are. It doesn't make us look worse than we are. It just simply says, here's what you look like. Either you're happy or you're not happy, but don't get mad at the mirror if you're not happy what you look like. And this is just the mirror. And, and when you look into the mirror of God's Word, don't get angry with God. Just simply say, God, you're revealing some things to me that I need to work on. I'm asking you to help me out with that. Obedience to God's word, in this case loving others, brings us freedom. While disobedience or hating others puts us in bondage as slaves to sin. And God's law gives us liberty when we obey his law. You obey the law of society, you have freedom. You break the law, you go to jail. Well, there's the fact of our judgment. Thank God for the fairness of our judgment. The fairness of our judgment. So in verse 13, the Bible says, For judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Remember, James is writing to fellow Christians. He's not talking to atheists out there. He's not talking to pagans. He's talking to born-again Christians. Whether they're truly saved or not, that's between them and God, but he certainly understands them to be Christians. He's speaking to the church, and he's made that very clear. He's called them brethren over and over again. He did it up again there in verse 5 of chapter 2. And so these are Christians. He's speaking to the church, and he's saying, these are the ones I'm talking to. So our salvation is not what is being judged, but our service is. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12 through 15. Listen to what he says. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. And that fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is Burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet as through fire. Wow. So he's talking about the beam of seat judgment. And what he's saying is, oh, you, you're going to get in because of what Jesus did for you. You don't, you don't get in because you're nice to people. You get in because of what Jesus did. So you're a born-again Christian. You're getting in. But here's the thing. You're going to give an account for yourself when you stand before that God. And then he's going to test your works. He's going to put the fire of God's word on it. If it burns up, he says, you'll get in, but you'll have nothing to offer God. Can you imagine standing before Almighty God, looking into his glorious face, standing in, the, in absolute holiness and purity, and then you say, God, I'm sorry, I have nothing to offer you. It all got burned up because I wasted my life. 
I thought I was getting away with stuff. And then you just tested it. And I thought it was better quality than it is, but it burned up and I have nothing to give you but a bunch of ashes. Wow! I pray that we'd be able to say, God, you've tested my works. They've passed the test. And here I have something to offer you. Thank you for dying for me to save my lost soul. Wow. A lot of folks think, yeah, if I just get in, I don't care. Well, it'll matter. It'll matter. Yeah, a lot of people say, if I just, if I just get in, you know, that's all I really care about. I just want to get in. I don't want to go to hell. So if I just get in, you know, if I'm just kind of in the back somewhere, and you know, you know we're going to say, God, I wish I had done more. I wish I had taken it more seriously. I wish I had loved more people. I wish I had witnessed more. I wish I had served more. I wish I had given more. God, I wish I was more sold out. I wish I had just taken it a little bit more seriously and lived in greater view of eternity than just get wrapped up in what's happening down here on this earth. Wow. There will probably be some people in that football game later on today, and, and they're going to lose. One of the teams is going to lose. and They'll probably think, if I had just ran a little harder, if I had just blocked a little stronger, if I had just kind of put a little more effort into that game, you know, we, we might just have won that game. Uh, I don't watch that fake football. I like the other one where they actually use their feet. You guys call it soccer. But I think that the Patriots kind of came back from, a, 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 they were losing and came back to get into the Super Bowl. The other team's probably thinking now, should be us. Had we tried a little harder, we could have been there. Had we moved a little more, we could have got there. We'd have just tried harder to tackle Tom Brady. We, we might have kept a couple of those touchdowns from going in. We might have been in the Super Bowl had we put a little more effort into it. When we stand before God, we're going to say, God, I wish I'd taken it a little bit more serious. I'd have something to offer you instead of these ashes. So he says, mercy triumphs over judgment. Thank God for his mercy. In, in Matthew 5, 7, in the Beatitudes, Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Proverbs 19, 17 says, One who is gracious to a poor man lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his good deed. Can I tell you that God is no cheapskate? He, he will never be in debt to anybody. When you do something for the Lord, he says, I'll make sure I pay you, and I'm going to always pay you more. I'll pay you with interest. So we do something for the Lord. He always far outweighs us when he, with the rewards that he gives us than the cost. And nobody's going to get to the other side and say, ah, I took this too serious. I gave too much money to the church. I, I served too much. I witnessed to too many people. I wish I just hung out and watched the ball game more. Nobody's going to say that. They're all going to say, I wish I had given a little more and done a little more. But what are the facts that concerning partiality? Partiality is a sin. We might downplay this character flaws. I just don't like certain people. It's just the way I was brought up. My dad didn't like these kind of people, and I don't like them either. But it's sin. Partiality is very serious. We might see it as being a small sin. Yeah, it's a sin. It's not good. I should love more people, but not that big of a deal. Uh, James said it's very serious. Uh, and then there's sentencing. We, we, we're going to be judged one day. And James says, let me make it very clear to you. I don't want to beat around the bush. You wonder, what am I talking about? James says, judgment will be merciless if you show no mercy. Right. When you get to the other side, you're going to wish that you had been more merciful to others. Right. Now, are you prejudiced towards anyone? Don't dismiss it as a minor character flaw. Now, listen to what Proverbs 28.13 says. He who conceals his transgressions, his sins, will not prosper. But he who confesses, listen now, and forsakes them will find compassion. We're, we're talking about the sin of partiality, but again, James said this pretty much sin is sin. And so what we need to say is, God, first of all, have I committed the sin of partiality? I want to confess that to you and ask you to help me with that. But God may say, yeah, you're doing pretty good. You seem to like most people. But, well, God, is there anything else in my life that I need to get cleaned up? Are there any other sins in my life, any other laws that I've broken, any other chains and links that have broken? God, am I stealing from you by not giving my tithes and offerings to your work? God, am I not exercising my spiritual gifts? God, am I failing to witness to a lost and dying world that you've placed in my path of you put me in that job not to make a paycheck or pay my bills. You put me there to give the gospel to everybody I work with. 
God, you have me at that school, not just so I can get through school and get my education, but God, you have me there so I can give the gospel to those other kids at school. And God, am I exercising my spiritual gifts? Am I witnessing? Am I doing what you call me to do? Are there any other areas of my life besides the sin of partiality where I need some help? God, in light of eternity, and knowing that I'm going to stand before you one day and give an account, is there anything in my life that displeases you that on the day of judgment I'm going to say, I wish I had taken care of that before I got here? And say, God, let me not just get distracted by the sin of partiality. I want to open up my heart wide open to you. Is there any sin in my life that needs to be taken care of? And then say, God, help me to get it taken care of now that I won't regret it on the day of judgment. God knows all the secret things. He's writing it all down, and he will deal with us. He's going to have plenty of time on judgment. Don't think there's going to be a lot of people there. He's going to be busy. He'll probably forget about this one. He's going to take all the time he needs to talk to us about it. You know, what a joy it was to see hundreds of men at that conference coming to the altar. I mean, hundreds. And there was dozens and dozens of men that came forward and said, I want, I want to receive salvation. I need to get saved. And only God knows a person's heart, why they went down, whether they're serious or not. That, that's not for us to decide. God will figure all that out. And this altar should be used every single week. This altar should be full every single week. In this church and in every church, this is the most important time during the, during the service, and we've got to say, God, you've spoken to me. Let me not just go home and say, okay, I'm glad that's over with, but let me say, God, I want to come down to the altar, and I want to do business. We just sang that song, come to the altar. God is available. He's willing to give you mercy and grace if you come to the altar, but he's not going to force you. And we've got to say, God, I want to come to the altar, and I want to talk to you, and I want to get right, so that in light of eternity... I'll be pleased on the day of judgment and not offer you ashes and say, what a wasted life I had. Wow. Only got one chance to get it right. Let's make sure we do that. Let's all stand for prayer. The praise team is coming. They have an invitation picked out for us. Sometimes we get so distracted by these invitations, we just stand there and sing songs and instead of really talking to the Lord. And what we really need to do is say, God, uh, I don't want to sing a song to you. I want to come down and I want to talk to you. And then come to the altar. And by the way, if, if God ever speaks to anybody in the praise team, don't feel like you're up there serving and you can't come down. Put the microphone down and come and talk to God. We can get by without music, but we can't get by without talking to God. And so come and pray and say, God, would you help me to do business with you here today and get my heart right? I want to be in absolute perfect line with the will of God. And God, help me to do all that I can to get right with you, to live for you, to serve you, to love you, to love all people everywhere. Let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, we are so overwhelmed by your mercy and by your grace and by the reality that you love all people, including us. And Father, we thank you for the difference that the Holy Spirit can make in a person's life when we're obedient to him. And God, I pray that even now that the Holy Spirit would look deep into the recesses of our heart. And Lord, you see every hidden thing that goes on. You know the hidden thoughts in our mind. You know what's in our heart. You know what we did last night. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to do business with you here today. I pray we take this time during the invitation and get on our knees before a holy God and ask you to search our hearts and to cleanse us of any wickedness that may be in our heart. And Lord, whether it be the sin of partiality or any other sin, let us take it serious. Father, is anybody here who needs salvation, I beg you in Jesus' name to save them before it's too late. Anybody walking at a guilty distance, bring them home. Father, stir our hearts, set us on fire, give us a vision from heaven, and let us obey that vision at all costs. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for loving us first and loving us the most. Speak now, and we will obey. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.